that the sun shines down its power to all the world and makes the wind blow strong as it will. I want to hope gentle rains can fall upon the land so lovely earth can stay lovely still. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 551st edition of Energy Week with George Harvey and the amazing Tom Fennell, also known as the Invisible Man. <laughs> in the flesh, but not in the studio. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> How did I know? Anyway, this is uh, a news aggregation uh, blog, geoharvey.com that I keep on a daily basis, and we picked the 21 best items from it. And there's some interesting items on there, believe me. Yes, there are. There are indeed. Um, the uh, stuff that's going on, in the, that went on in the last week, become, be, includes the beginning of COP28, which is the um, meeting that is now going on in Dubai. Well, we'll be touching base on that. We will indeed. And uh, I should say, this comes from geoharvey.com. You can go there and you can click on the calendar to get to a particular date. We try to keep you uh, apprised of what date the news we're talking about is from. You can also go to a couple of uh, uh, resources that are below the picture on the screen if you're if you're able to find those not everybody would be able to but one of them is um, is uh, the the script sort of script that Tom and I use every week to put the show together and the other one is uh, a a uh, file a word document that that is also of the same script so you can get to these stories to read them in whole, if that's what you want to do, and I hope well, we give a link to where to the sources. So you that's right. That's source. right. Yep, yeah, that is right. So, should I start? It is. Okay. Our first picture is a picture of a solar array, solar farm in Wisconsin. How do you know it's Wisconsin? Because the um, the it's so the, you know I went and found this online. Um, sometimes I get I get material from the uh, article that I actually got, and it's possible that I did that in this case. Well, it came from Wisconsin Public Radio, so it's likely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You are in this picture looking south, and the reason I know that is because you're looking at the at the the. I should say the panels in the array are aimed away from you, which is why they don't look normal. Um, so you can't really tell that from the picture, though. What's that? You can't really tell that from the picture. Well, they, they look thin. <laughs> what can I say? Okay, Wisconsin Public Radio, what do you have for a title? GOP bill would pull farmland tax credits from farmers hosting solar power installations. Yeah. yeah that, that's not good news. That's, that's kind of stupid. It's cheap is what it is. Farm fields with solar PVs would no longer qualify for state tax credits under a Republican bill. GOP lawmakers claim it's about protecting farmland from, quote, nonsense, end quote, renewable projects, and Wisconsin should pursue nuclear energy instead. Yeah, nu nuclear. You gotta, you gotta say it right. Nuclear. <laughs> That's what Jimmy Carter used to say. Um, what they want to do is they want to make sure that farmers use their their land for uh, raising crops, which of course means that they don't know that there is such a thing as agrivoltaics. They want the farmers not to have the income from renewable energy, and they want uh, taxpayers in, Chica in uh, Wisconsin to pay extra for nuclear because it costs about four times, three times as much as uh, renewable energy, even when the it's renewable energy is backed up with batteries. It's got a lot of problems, too, the biggest of which is disposal of waste. 
Yeah, that might be the biggest one. And as a matter of fact, there's a terrible problem going on right now in the UK where the Sellafield site has got a, a nuclear waste silo that has started to leak. And there is liquid coming out of it. And they don't think they will be able to stop it. So they oh. expect it to leak for, they said, until at least 2050. Oh, wow. Now, this is what happens when you have nuclear junk all over the place. Don't eat nuclear fuel. It's not good for you. I hear you. <laughs> okay. Should we go on, Tom? Yeah, let's move along. we got some mud pots. I've never heard that term before. I have, and uh, it was mud pots. I think it was a picture that was very similar to this several years ago. And it was about the same subject. And this discovery, I think, is... Well, this is from Clean Technica, and they're talking about a discovery. And what? I will comment on this after, after the synopsis is read. Go ahead. Yes. This is in C, which is loaded with... Uh, with lithium. Lithium. Yeah. What do you got for a title? U.S. discovers lithium bonanza for EV batteries right in its own backyard. Yeah. The, the Department of Energy released the results of an analysis of the salt and sea lithium resources by Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Direct lithium extraction technology could lead, lead to the production of more than 3,400 kilotons of lithium, enough for over 375 million electric uh, vehicle batteries. They're not kidding when they talk about lithium bananas, are they? No, they aren't. You and I have talked about this. You knew, you know, that the Salton Sea had a lot of lithium. Yeah. Already. We didn't need to know this, it, read it, this it, article. It's all, it's, it's, it's lithium, lithium oxide or something like that. It's, it's, it's a all. lithium solution that's in the water that comes up from... Correct. Right. Now, what you're seeing here, these, these mud pots are basically like little teeny volcanoes that spit out mud. And they are, um, this water comes up to the surface, it's hot, it has mud, it spits it out, makes a little pile of mud. That's called a mud pot. So they're natural, they're not man-made. Not man-made, and the smoke-looking stuff that you see around here is because of the, um, the hot water that's coming up to the surface. Oh, steam. We've known about this. Tom and I have known about this. We talked about it years ago. Um, but the, the discovery here was not that there was lithium there. This was known. Um, the thing that nobody really did know was just how much lithium there was. And so... There's a lot. Yeah, there's a huge amount. So the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab... Uh, did an assessment of how much lithium there is, and they came up with this amount, 3,400 kilotons, which is 3.4 million tons of lithium. Um, I would assume... That's enough 375 million batteries. Yeah, 375 million batteries. Everybody could have his own EV, even the little babies. <laughs> okay, should we go on? Yes, it's okay. We have an interesting a, picture here. Uh, you're gonna have to explain what it is. Well, let's see. We have an interesting picture. This is Project Red. Looks uh, like a bunch of cooling towers. Well, it is actually. Um, it's not. It's not cooling towers so much as uh, the whole thing is a geothermal generating station. And oh. uh, as I said, this comes from Clean Technica. That's what it says. Yeah. Hydro Energy revs up its first geothermal, geothermal generating station. Yep. Fervo Energy is using a horizontal drilling perfected by oil and gas industry to access regions where it is hot enough to make superheated steam for generating electricity. The drilling can be expensive, but once a heat source is tapped, the energy can be free for years. Is it that interesting? It'll be free for as long as it can, as you can tap geothermal uh, energy. And there are geothermal sites that have... 
What? You're looking for the heat. Yeah. The heat is used to drive turbines. And uh, I was going to say there are geothermal sites that are no longer used. They've run the course. I remember reading about one in New Zealand uh, probably 10 years ago that uh, they, they figured out that the land around the um, geothermal plant had subsided by about a foot. And the reason was because of the removal of heat from the crust. But be that as it may, it... Um, That's interesting. You remove heat and it subsides. Yeah, well, you know, things, when things cool, they contract. You remove heat, they cool off. Yeah. We are up to Friday, December 1st. The material that we've done like, so far is from Thursday, November 30th. And we got a picture of a Vestas prototype turbine. That's, that's correct. And I think, but I don't know, that this is the turbine in the article. This is from ReNews. Vestas, 15 megawatt prototype certified. Yep. Vestas has received a type certification for its V236 15 megawatt offshore wind turbine. V236, by the way, talks, it tells you that it is, the windswept area is 256 meters across. That's a big turbine. That is a big turbine. Look at the bottom of that turbine mast. Those, those are cranes down there. Those are big cranes down there. They're not, they're not joking around with those things. Yeah, right. And, and just think about how those cranes lifted the uh, the uh, nacelle and the and the generator and all that stuff to the top of that turbine. How do you suppose they did that? Well, we uh, we've talked about this turbine before. This is huge. It is huge. Yeah. Uh, how do you think they got everything up there with with little bitty cranes like that, which are only about fifty stories tall? Uh, they use skyhooks. I was gonna say that you 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 beat me to it. <laughs> we always had sky hooks wherever I wherever I uh, worked when I was working in chemical field. Okay, have we have we finished with that? Well, it says the turbine broke the oh, world yeah. record power produced by one turbine in a twenty-four hour period. Yeah, that's right. Three hundred and sixty-three megawatt hours. 363 megawatt hours in 24 hours. That's a lot. And you figure, what's a megawatt hour? Well, if you want, it's About maybe... About kilowatt hours. Yeah, it is. But maybe a megawatt hour in this, in this case is uh, $65. So it, it did 363 times $65 worth of... Um, I don't think I read the synopsis for this. Oh, I did. I did read it. Sorry. Yeah. Um, it, anyway, this is a big turbine, and this is not a turbine that would be put up on land, by the way, because you've got to get uh, blades and the mast to it, to the site where it goes up. And just imagine going... Yeah. Just imagine going down the road with a blade that's uh, 100, 130 me yards long. Um, it's not going to. You're not going to steer that truck very well. Well, so, we see some pictures of it, and it's actually sitting on two or three trucks in a row. Yeah. 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 Okay. Should we go on? It's it. Now we've got a picture from Dubai, and what's going on in Dubai is COP28. This is from ABC News, ABC being, in this case, the American Broadcast Co uh, Corporation. We have another ABC that we show things from sometimes, which is the Australian Broadcast Corporation. And I... It doesn't, it doesn't say news. Yeah, that one, uh, the, way that, uh, the way they are distinguished is that the, the one in the United States says news and the one in Australia just says ABC. Well, you mentioned COP. Yeah. We'll be talking about that, and we what, it, what it's worth, it stands for Conference of Parties. It's a process. That's right. And this picture um, is the inside of a, of a very odd-looking building, kind of beautiful in its way. Um, and we will see another picture from the outside, and I'll mention it when we get to it. Okay, what's the title here? Why 
hold UN climate talks 28 times. Do the talks even matter? Okay, the conference of parties process gives every nation in the world, rich or poor, large or small, a seat at the table to discuss how climate change is impacting them and how they believe the world should confront it. Ultimately, the Conference of Parties is the only game in town. So this is the only worldwide conference. It's, it's the only place, certainly, that gives small nations an opportunity to be heard. Well, it gives small patient nations an opportunity to be ignored, really. <laughs> Truth be told. But they do go there, and they do say what's on their mind, and in some cases they say, don't you people realize that we're not going to have a nation anymore? And they do say that, because some of them are going to disappear. Yeah. The uh, ocean is rising, and some of these countries are on pieces of land that don't have anything that's much above ocean level. And it so, is an interesting picture, though. That's a heck of a building. Yeah, it is. It is. And as I said, we will see the outside. Okay, I'm going to put up the next picture. This is a picture I found when I, looking, I was looking for, um, I was doing a search for, for uh, uh, images uh, that were called hot weather. And I thought... Well, you got one. I got one. That's right. And honestly, I don't know that it was hot this day. I really don't. But the person who took the picture gave it a title that said that it was hot weather. Okay, this is from BBC. Quote, COP28, colon, poor countries win a 30-year fight for climate cash. These poor people have been trying to get money for 30 years, and they finally got some. In a surprise, COP28 delegates agreed to launch a long-awaited fund to pay for damage from storms and drought worsened by climate change. Storms and drought and other things. Such deals are normally sealed at the last minute after days of ne negotiations. But COP28 President Sultan Ab uh, Al Jabbar put the decision on the floor on day one. This uh, Sultan Al Jabbar is an interesting fellow who is, um, has become kind of controversial because of a statement that he made. And uh, I, I think we should, we did go into it, I think, in the last show. And uh, it, he's, he says basically that the statement that he made is being misquoted. And he may be right. Sultan um, is his name, it's not a title. Sultan, Sultan is his name? Yeah. Okay. I didn't know that. Okay. Well, <coughs> pardon me. We're up to Saturday, December 2nd. Looks like a whole bunch of batteries to That's me. That's what it is. It's the, either that or my Aunt Ruth's button collection. <laughs> okay, this is from Clean Technica. Well, there are a bunch of lithium-ion batteries, according to the picture. That's and what it, it is. Record low EV battery prices in 2023. Yeah. Thanks to a variety of factors, lithium-ion battery prices are at record low prices. After dropping 14%, they're down to $139 per kilowatt hour. The steep price drop and record low average price come on the heels of price increases in 2022 that had brought, bra uh, brought battery prices back to 2020 levels. The world changes fast. Now, I want to explain, we have, we've talked about this before. The price, $139 per kilowatt hour, cannot properly be compared to the price of electricity. If you're paying 18 cents per kilowatt hour for electricity, um, in your house, at your wall, that's 18 cents for, per kilowatt hour. These batteries are $139 per kilowatt hour. Why the difference? Because when you're, battery, when you're buying electricity from the utility, you're buying electricity. But when you're ba buying batteries, you're buying an object in which to store electricity. 
And the difference well, between the... It's not the same thing. It's not the same thing. The difference between the price of the electricity and the price of the battery is like the difference between uh, the price of a gallon of water and... You're talking about the capacity of the battery. That's right. It's like the difference between the, the, the cost of a gallon of water and the cost of a 5,000-gallon tank truck that would haul the water. It's Makes a sense. very different thing. Uh, yeah. You might you might buy five thousand gallons of, of water for five thousand dollars, but you're not going to buy a tank truck that you can haul that around in for five thousand dollars. Yep. Okay. Our next picture, which is coming up, I'm getting is a, hungry. <laughs> yeah, I see I see pictures of shrimp, and I get hungry, and that's yeah. that's just the truth. Um. This is also from ABC News. What do you got for a title? New England's decades-old shrimp fishery, a victim of climate change, to remain closed indefinitely. Yeah. In New England, the shrimp business fell victim to warming waters in 2013 because of a moratorium by regulators. A healthy shrimp population needs cold water. The moratorium will remain in place indefinitely, fishery regulations, uh, regulators ruled. Now, why would shrimp need cold water? The amount of oxygen that will dissolve in the water depends upon how hot the water is. The hotter it is, the less oxygen will dissolve. At a certain level of, of warmth, the shrimp just don't get enough oxygen to live in. There's not enough air for it to breathe. That's right. And the same thing is true of a lot of animals. Uh, in Vermont, we have brown uh, trout and brook trout and things like that, which are going to be yeah. wiped out. Right. Some of them already are practically wiped out by warmer weather. The streams just aren't as cold as they used to be. So, the tr And the trout are very active fish. And so they need a lot of oxygen. So, okay, should we go on or should we stop for lunch? Moving right along. Moving right along. We yeah. see a nice picture of emissions. Yeah. And what, you, what I'm going to point out here is the, the general direction of emissions, 2018 on the right and 2000. 23, 24, what is expected on, I'm sorry, 2018 on the left. It's pretty steady. It's a pretty steady drop, except that it dropped a lot between 2019 and 2020. That was because people were not working. They weren't going anywhere, and that was because of COVID-19. And that was still a little bit down in 2021. It recovered very slightly in 2022. Um, and it has dropped since then, and the expectation is that it will continue to drop. You'll notice that the amount of emissions from coal today is, um, is below, uh, it's, it, it's a little more than half of what it was in 2018. Yeah, it makes sense. So that's, that's what's going on. So you have, this is from Clean Technica. Do you have a... A title. A title, yeah. I'm going to say that because it sort of explains what you just said. Yes. <laughs> Lower U.S. CO2 emissions due, in part, to shifts in power generation sources. Yes. A forecast by the U.S. Energy Information Administration is for the U.S. energy sector to emit about 4,790 million metric tons of carbon dioxide. In 2023, a 3% decrease from 2022. Much of this decline results from lower in electricity generation from coal-powered plants. So well, they're, they're cost, costing too much money, so they're not being renewed. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay, we're up to Sunday, December 3rd. And, you know, the coal... You know, there's an interesting thing going on here, Tom. When Barack Obama was president of the United States, the, the people in the coal industry were complaining that he had declared war on coal because their industry was just falling. Now, I got to tell you, 
The U.S. started moving away from coal for some purposes in about 1912. <laughs> the, the, the Navy was not building coal-powered ships during the First World War anymore. They, they had already long That's since right. started. Yeah, they had started moving to oil because it was a much better energy show, source for ships. It was were, a lot easier to transport and deliver. Oh, yeah. There were something like 850,000 coal miners in the United States in 2023. The, the, the number of coal miners was still going up um, after, after the First World War because we were expanding on land far faster than the decline of use of coal at sea. The, the decline in coal, mi the number of coal miners had gone to the point where when Barack Obama left office, it was down significantly from when he took office. It was about 52,000 miners. That's what Donald Trump started with. And Donald Trump proceeded to dig coal you know, as he's, he told everybody, he dug coal. And when he left office, the number of coal miners was down in the area of 40,000 people. So about 20 percent. Yeah, about 20 percent of the coal miners lost their jobs while Trump was in the White House. But he was telling them that he was he was working on their behalf. What he was actually doing was pushing natural gas, which was out competing with coal. And for whatever reason, and I don't know what the cause of this is, when um, Joe Biden took office with about 40,000, 42,000 coal miners, since then, the, the number of, of miners in the United States has increased to about 50,000. Now, this is the, the figures that I'm getting from the um, employment people in Washington, D.C., the federal employment people. And I don't, I really don't know why there would be more coal miners under Joe Biden, but now the coal industry is talking about how dreadful Joe Biden is because he's made war on coal. I don't understand it. But, you know, there you have it. Okay. We have a picture here. Uh, we're up to Sunday, December 3rd, and an article from Clean Technica. Well, I was going to ask, what is that big thing in the middle of that picture? Well, we'll get it explained when we re read the, uh, the stuff. Oh, the... Uh, okay. <laughs> I'm getting ahead of myself. You are. That's okay, Tom. So, new CO2 energy storage system could blow past... Lithium ion. <laughs> Yes, could blow, blow past lithium ion. Yeah, this is an energy dome, energy storage system. And it is a carbon dioxide storage system. That's what we're seeing in the picture. Carbon, it's a great big balloon. It, it, I think that's what it is. It's a great big balloon. Or it's half of a great big balloon. Um, the, the other half not being there. This one is just, you know, they put half a balloon on. Okay, it's half a blimp. Carbon dioxide reaches a liquid state when it's compressed, and it expands with a pop when it's released. Now, the Italian startup Energy Dome is ready to harness the action for a new energy storage system that could provide far more storage at le far less cost than lithium-ion batteries. There are many, many, many different ways to store energy. And so that dome there is full of CO2. That thing, yeah, I believe it probably is. Although the way they're actually storing that CO2 is as a liquid. So, you know. So it could be a liquid. Could be. That's not going to be a liquid in the balloon, no. Okay. Um, they, may, they may have that balloon so they can capture it as they, as they create energy with it so it just doesn't escape into the atmosphere. And they'll move it somewhere else to store it. Yeah, that's right. They, they would probably compress it um, to, to make it liquid again and then store it as a liquid. Makes sense. So, you know, it's a, it's a reusable thing. Okay, um, our next item, and we are a little bit behind schedule here, is from CNN, and we have a picture of storm damage. Looks 
like damage to me. Well, I think it probably is. I don't think they intended to build the building to look like this. Climate change is costing the U.S. $150 billion a year. That's what it says. In total, extreme weather events cost the United States $150 billion per year due to direct impacts such as infrastructure damage, injuries, and agricultural loss. And that's what the picture says. What? Yeah, uh, this, is, uh, this is damage. That's infrastructure damage, baby. That's what it is. The authors of a report uh, estimated this. And the cost of extreme weather events is expected to grow in the near term as sea levels and temperatures rise. And, you know. Not good news. No, I, I feel sorry for this guy if he's looking at the wreckage of his own home. And I wouldn't be surprised if that's what it is. Can you imagine coming home either. and finding your, your home look like, looking like that? It's not exactly a pleasant idea. Okay. Our next, moving right along, our next item, we have a picture of oil field. That is an oil field. And a donkey. Huh? And there's a nodding donkey in the foreground. A, no <laughs> a nodding donkey. That's what they call that, uh, that pump. Yes. Okay, and this is from ABC News also. How the U.S. Oil, U.S. and oil industry plans to drastically cut methane emissions. Yeah. Environmental Defense Fund President Fred Krupp said the oil and gas decarbonization compact requires all oil, requires oil firms to reduce their methane emissions by 80 to 90 percent over the next five years while providing monitoring records to an international verification body. Well, that's good news. I think so, although I will tell you that I think that there are people in this world who will complain that it is international organizations trying to take over free American positions and, you know, really some of the stuff that they say, I, I, it, it amazes me that, you know, they would say that they should be allowed to make oil and uh, methane emissions. We are up to Monday, December 4th, and we have a picture of the South China, I should say, I'm, I'm sorry, this is from the South China uh, Morning Post, but the picture is from Indonesia. And that is an in, that is a geothermal energy plant. And there that, is nothing. Go ahead. Well, Indonesia has phenomenal geothermal power potential. Indonesia has a lot of uh, potential for thermal power. Indonesia is home to forty percent of the global geothermal resources, and is keen to harvest. Forty percent. 40%. Well, you know, Indonesia is not exactly a small country. You don't think of it as being big. Oh, it's, it's all stretched all over the oh, place. Oh, it, it's stretched all over the place, yeah. yeah. And it's, it's just got all these islands, but it's on the Ring of Fire. There is uh, a lot of geothermal energy there, and they also have a lot of oil. Um, but, you know... Okay, experts do not agree about whether the industry will be able to hit its ambitious goals to generate large amounts of energy given the lack of re incentives and the costs. So that's where they are. And, um, yeah. Well, let's move on. We've got a nice picture okay. there of a floating solar array. We do indeed, and that is... That array is huge. World's largest floating solar power plant taking shape on a hydropower plant. Yes, huh? this is at Clean, Techn Clean Technica. That water that that's on is a, is a reservoir for a hydropower oh, it's a plant. It's a for the hydro plant. Right, and where do you suppose it is? It's in a country with the greatest resources for geothermal power. <laughs> The plans for the world's largest floating solar, solar power plant show how quickly 
floating solar field can grow. The project is to expand an existing 145 megawatts of floating solar array in the Chirata hydropower reservoir in West Java, Indonesia, to up to 500 megawatts. That's so a lot it's a of reservoir for hydropower. Yeah, and it's being given a, a second use. Yes, and it actually could be given more use too, because you know, as a as a hydropower plant, you could use it as a as a water resource for drinking water. You could use it as a resource for for growing fish if you wanted to. Yeah. Okay, we have a picture coming up of a Chevrolet. Looks like it to me. Yep, it's a Chevrolet, 2024 Chevrolet Equinox EV 3LT. Vehicle, vehicle. Yeah, this is from Clean Technica. GM expects its electric vehicles to become profitable in 2025. Yeah, when GM chief financial officer Paul Jacobson spoke to analysts at Barclays in a conference, he admitted the country had not found the pace it had expected to meet its EV making goals. Nevertheless, he expressed confidence that GM's EVs would be profitable in 2025. Well, it is the way in the future. It is, yeah. And Mary Barra, who is the CEO of GM, is apparently very much behind EVs. Okay, we're up to Tuesday, December 5th, and we have that other picture of the building that I promised earlier on. You can see it kind of in the, in the, in the distance there. You see what I mean, Tom? I don't quite see it. Remember that building we had at the very beginning of the show? Yeah, yeah, I do remember that. Yeah, well, this, that's, this is a different view of it. That's a very different view. That is pretty far away. And, you know, if, if you could see to a person who was at the door of that building, which you can't because there's too many people in the way here, that person would look uh, more or less like a speck on this, on this picture. So <laughs> these are happening in the Emirates. Yes, this is in Dubai. And CN this is from CNN. And for anybody who doesn't know, the Arab, uh, the United Arab, Arab em Emirates, UAE, has I think seven emirates in it. Does that sound right to you, Tom? All oh, right, yeah, it's a seven or eight, six, yeah. seven, something and, like that. And you know, there's there each of them is different, and Dubai is one of the most important from a financial point of view. I, I forget what the other ones are. I remember Sharjah, which is... That's I think, one of I think it's the largest and the one that has the least amount of money. Uh-huh. Uh, but uh, anyway, this is from... Well, these C are all cut, little countries, emirates, that, uh, that, that didn't want to be part of Saudi Arabia. Yes. The emir, if you were emir of an emirate, would you, which is kind of like being a king, would you like to give that up to Saudi Arabia? And these guys didn't want it. They didn't want to, so they made this United Arab Emirates, which is on the Ar Arabian Peninsula. What do you have for title? Fossil fuel industry nearly quadrupled registrations at climate summit since last year. Yeah. More than 2,400 people connected to the fossil fuel industry registered to attend the COP28 climate summit in Dubai. That's nearly four times the number that signed up for last year's climate gathering, according to an, uh, an analysis. Well, what do you suppose they're going, to, they're doing, going to the to the COP28 meeting? You know, well, they know that everybody's going to be talking about putting them out of business. Maybe that's why they're there. Yeah. Maybe. Okay, we have a, an autonomous truck. Picture of an autonomous truck. So there's no driver in that truck. There's no driver. There's no door. There's no windshield. There's no nothing. Um, and there it is. And this autonomous is Autonomous electric truck transports GE appliances. Yes, this is from Clean Technica. Einride is one of the many startups that have been uh, built on big goals regarding autonomous electric transport. 
Most of them never uh, get far and never make such an impact. Einride got a deal direct, uh, actually putting its autonomous truck to work. And this is in Selmer, Tennessee, of all places. And what is it doing? It's moving around GE appliances. That's what, what it's doing. So it's actually sold a vehicle and making some money from that. Well, it's delivering these appliances. Yes. Okay. Our next item is, this is from Clean Technica, and we have a picture of a uh, wind turbine and other wind turbines in the distance. Yeah, there's a bunch of wind turbines there. <clears throat> this is a New York wind project. This is actually in a state that Vermont borders on. Can you imagine that? That's pretty close. <laughs> where is it in New York, you know? I don't know. I don't know where that is. Well, I'll read the title. Yeah. New York developer launches $1.2 billion renewable energy fund for the USA. Right. Uh, yeah. Fresh off the launch of the New York Climate Exchange, New York City, and that's not a picture of New York City, is becoming the, an epicenter of renewable energy development. Though space for new uh, wind turbines and solar panels within the city is limited, sure is, the $1.2 billion fund will set up clean power assets across the United States. Now, well, this, we're sitting right there on a continental shelf, so there's yeah. limited places to put these things. Yeah. Um, and this, you know, obviously New York has got wind turbines that are, um, it's got wind turbines that are um, uh, on land, and this is one of them that we're looking at. And, you know, it's an amazing thing to me. I watch, you know, as I go through the news, I, I, I go through something over 300 uh, looking at 300 titles for news items every day. And I've been, you know, if you figure out how many, how many days I've been doing this, you see that since I started doing my blog, I've done well over a million. I've looked at well over a million titles. Um, and it, it just astonishes me how often um, uh, Catherine Hochul's name comes up. Hochul is the governor of New York, and she, New York, right. she is just doing stuff with renewable energy constantly. It's like, it pretty almost, sharp lady. yeah, she is. It, it, I think it feels almost like she's got an order that her um, her uh, departments that are that are operating in New York have to come up with a new article on some new renewable energy stuff daily. Because you know, she could be the first woman president in the United States. Well, I think she could be. Yeah, I think that's right. But um, the the um, the thing about Catherine uh, Governor Hochul is that she she's doing this stuff, and when she releases something which is happening on a daily basis, the stuff that is is talked about is not trivial. There are big things happening in New York State, and they're She's just sharp, this lady. going. Yeah, I think she is, and it just goes on and on and on. So, I think that road in that picture is kind of amusing the way it curls around. You see that, Tom? Yeah. It's just you know they have to get to every one of those wind turbines. Okay, we are up to Wednesday, the sixth of December. No. Oh do that. This is a picture which is titled Smoke. Looks like a hot day. Well, it's, yeah, it's because the sky is kind of orange. It's sundown or sunrise. I don't know which. Um, but it's, it's uh, a twilight period. And this article is from the BBC. And it says, quote, is the world about to promise to ditch fossil fuels. Yeah. COP28 may be close to a big breakthrough on reducing the gas heating our planet, its UAE hosts believe, showing uh, what they call cautious optimism. The UAE negotiating team believes that COP28 is getting ready 
to commit to phasing down fossil fuels over the coming decades, or even ditching them altogether. Now, this well, is... Well, it's, it's uh, to misquote Bill Clinton, it's the economics, stupid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's the case. Um, the, the man who is the president of COP28 happens to be the CEO of one of the biggest oil companies in the world. And, you know, he, was, he had said that he felt that uh, when 2050 was here, we were still going to be using fossil fuels. And he said that in a way that was kind of unfortunate because it sounded like he, uh, I, I, th I think it was, it was, what he said was, we could, we could um, eliminate the use of fossil fuels if we don't mind living in caves. And people quoted him on that saying that it, it um, showed that he was not really interested in getting to eliminate uh, climate change. But I think that uh, what he, he, tried, he tried to straighten out what he had said, and I think he may have achieved that. But what's happening here with this particular story is that the UAE hosts, and that would include uh, Sultan Al Jabbar, is that his name? Um, believe that we're we're approaching a um, phase down or possibly a phase out of fossil fuel use, and that between now and 2050, this is going to be accomplished. And like I said, it's economic stupid. That's it's economics, but of course, it's also other things. If we don't do that, we're going to have a a human tragedy as an impact that I think will be of utterly almost unimaginable scale. We're having people die um, every year from air pollution and from the effects of climate change, heat, uh, flooding. We're, we're only starting to get into ocean level rise, but it's, the ocean level is rising. And, oh, uh, yeah, it is. Yeah. And, you know, what, what's going to happen between now and 2050 is we're going to have 27 years or 26 years or something um, in which this is going to get worse. And it's, it's clear that, you know, maybe, maybe next year will not be as bad as this year. Maybe it'll be worse. I don't know. There are, there are projections that it will be worse. But the, the, uh, the, the toll uh, in terms of climate change is just horrible. And we're seeing that with fires, with drought, and so forth. So all of that, you know, you said it's the economic stupid. And yeah, the thing is, sea level rise, drought, the um, flooding, uh, wildfires and so forth. All of that costs money, and you know we were saying that earlier in the show that it's 150 billion dollars a year in the United States. It's all connected. It's all connected. Do you want to go bankrupt trying to tell everybody that you're not going bankrupt? I don't think that's a viable solution. Okay, we have other things to talk about. Let's talk about something happier. Okay. A little picture of a Tesla Model Y. A Tesla Model Y, that's right. And this is from Clean Technica. And what do you have for a title? EVs take 90.6% share in Norway. Yeah, that's a lot. November saw plug-in EVs take a 90.6% share in Norway, up from 89.3% year on year. And, you know, <coughs> Tom, I, I look at this and I say, Wait a minute, that's only 1.3%. That's barely an increase. Well, when you're up to 89.3%, you're not going to make a huge increase in one year. But um, th this is the thing that really struck me about this story. The next sentence. Petrol-only vehicles saw a record low share of 0.6% of the auto market. Wow, that's less than 1%. That's less than 1%. Now, I don't know why anybody would buy 
a gasoline-powered car in Norway. But if they had an oil well in the backyard. It, we, it, Norway has got huge income from oil and gas in the North Sea. Yeah, they do. But nobody's buying gasoline-powered cars, and the diesel cars are only about 1%. And just think about this. If the, if the percentage of, of electric vehicles keeps going down, I mean, uh, keeps going up, the percentage of gasoline and oil-powered vehicles is going to go down. So at some point, the local gas pump goes out of business because it can't make business. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you start having to worry about how far are you going to drive in your gasoline-powered car? The problem of range that people have had with electric vehicles is going to be a problem, not for the electric vehicles, but for the gasoline-powered cars. Well, we saw a nice picture last week of a, kind of a carport with a charger on the roof. Yeah. And, you know, that, that kind of thing's going to proliferate. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to read the rest of this synopsis. Overall auto volume was 10,348 units, somewhat below seasonal norms. The Tesla Model Y was again September's best seller. Several new models debuted, and those were from um, a variety of companies. But they're getting into a point where people are, are going to want not to have a gasoline-powered car because they're too inconvenient because it's too hard to get gasoline. Yeah. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, I can... That's inevitable. Yeah, that's what it's going to be. If a person buys a gasoline-powered car today, how long is it going to last before he gets fed up with it and decides that it's time to get rid of it just because it is inconvenient? It's too far the, the, for the, to the next gas station. Well, if you can park your car in a little carport, and the next morning, you tell your, your tank is full. <laughs> That's a yeah. pretty good thing. You, you've charged your battery overnight. That's Absolutely. Right. And at a cost that is a whole lot lo lower than the cost of, of filling your, your gas tank. And because you don't likely drive very far anyway, and actually that is something that is true of Norway, People don't drive very far normally. And the reason for that is because the Norwegians, a lot of them live um, along uh, fjords. And to get from one side of the fjord to the other side of the fjord, you're either going to have to drive 20 miles to get to the end of the fjord, or you're going to have to take a ferry. And so they don't, they don't tend to drive. They do have a lot of... Um, uh, airplanes taking off and landing, just carrying people short distances. And the result of that is that in Norway, the um, aviation industry is turning very heavily to electric airplanes. Interesting. Yeah, who it's, have, it's kind who of... Electric airplanes, wow. Well, yeah, who'd have thought? Electric airplanes. And... If the Hindenburg had not had gasoline-powered motors, but it had electric motors, maybe it would not have crashed, burned. Might not have burned, anyhow. Yeah, yeah. might not have burned. So, Interesting. Okay. Our we'll next, right. yep, our next uh, item is the last. We have a picture of a 2025 Sierra EV. Ele uh, elevation. That's. I think that's the name of the of the uh, vehicle. I'm not sure, but this is from Clean Technica. Our future is electric, but GM's chief sustainability officer wants more EV infrastructure support. Yeah, Kristen Seaman, chief sustainability officer at General Motors, appealed for EV policy support in and. Um, in infrastructure to help make our transportation all electric. A robust EV infrastructure is needed for non, uh, I'm sorry, for profitable plug-in passenger vehicles. They're, they're saying that we need to have uh, more charging stations and other support. 
and faster charging stations. Faster charging stations. They want the charging stations to to. They want they want to make driving an EV no more difficult than than um, than it is to drive a gasoline powered car today. So, if I wanted to visit my son who lives in Wisconsin, I'd be able to get into a and I wouldn't drive there in in, in one day. Um, if I were much, much, much younger, I might be able to do that. But today, I, I might take two days or I might take three to drive from Brattleboro to an area which is not far from, um, it's northwest of Chicago and not very far away. Uh, I would drive it to a, to a uh, motel or something like that that would have an EV charger. Yeah, let it charge. And it could charge overnight. So yep. it wouldn't even have to be a fast charger. It could be a cheap charger. And uh, then if I had to stay a second night on the road, I could do the same thing again. And well, fast charging technology is going to happen, but it hasn't happened yet. Yeah, and the other thing, too, is, you know, there are cars coming along that have huge distances that they will go. I read about one that has... Um, it would drive 600 miles on one charge. And the highest price, Aptera, we've talked about Apteras here from time to time. The highest price model um, is supposed to be able to drive over 1,000 miles on one charge. 1,000 miles on a charge, that, that ain't hey. No, and if I had a vehicle like that, I'd be able to drive to my son's house in one, in one charge. And on top of that, the vehicle is completely covered with solar cells, and it will gain 25 miles in a, on a sunny day in Vermont. Now, in some parts of the United States, it would gain 40 miles of, of distance. It's an interesting concept. We haven't seen much about it, but it's inevitable. Yeah, I think it is. Solar so, cells on the roof, yeah. So, Tom, we're at the end of the rope. I'm sorry, the end of the day, the end of the show. And I'm going to put up a, a, a slide that tells watchers to have an incomprehensibly delightful week. How's that? Say that one again. Incomprehensibly delightful. All right, I'm ready for that. <laughs> okay. I am You're waving goodbye to everybody. Yeah. Tom is. And yeah. I always ask, is your cat waving goodbye? Cat is. I haven't even seen him this morning. Really? Yeah, he's, oh, he's here, but he's <laughs> he's hiding out. He doesn't want to wave goodbye. Okay. He's got, new, he's got a nice chin, and he likes to lie in. Okay. Well, Tom, I'm going to ask you to say uh, to tell people to come back and see us again. Y'all come back and see us now. You hear? <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> <laughs>